buddies, fellow Franco fans. Hola, como esta? Muy bien. I am your host, Jason Rudy, from Desperate Visions Productions, Sacramento, California, based, blah, 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 doing post-production sound work, blah, 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 on Lady Hyde and Manuel in Sin City, blah, 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 starting a new job again, blah, 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 you know, same stuff. All the stuff in the real world, but uh, we uh, listen to shows to escape the real world. And uh, with Jess Franco films, they are a great escape. So this being episode 72, we jump into film number seven, which is the sadistic Baron Von Klaus. Uh, This is the... Uh, what I say, the seventh film from Jess Franco. And uh, at this time, he's starting to get his wheels going. So um, once again, taking all information from Murderous Passions, The Delirious Cinema, Jesus Franco, Volume 1 by Stephen Thrower. Uh, let's see, the sadistic Baron von Klaus, Spain and France, co-production, 1962. The original theatrical title and country of origin, La Mano de un hombre muerto, the hand of a dead man. Alternative titles uh, in France, it's known as Le Sédic Baron von Klaus, a French provincial title, The Sadist, Le Sédic, um, not Raphael Sédic, let's see, Italian theatrical, uh, Symphony for a Sadist, Sinfonia per un Sadico, uh, French video, Hysterical Sadist, Hysterical Sadik, and finally the Portuguese DVD, O Sadico Baro Von Klaus. Production company on this, Albatross Film, CPC, out of Madrid. French prints add a George Eston Erosinus release out of Paris. Theatrical distributors, Hispower Films, SA Madrid, and the mighty Erosine out of Paris. All right, timeline, shooting date on this, late autumn, they say, of 1962. So that would be like uh, October, maybe, November, somewhere on there. Uh, French visa issued August 8th of 63. Uh, France premiere of this was September 13th of 1963, so about a year after it was shot. Uh, Barcelona, it played on January 27th of 1964, and then further, May 25th of 64, it played Seville, and finally the re-release in France uh, four years later in July of 1967. Um, So let's see, theatrical running time on this film. Uh, Spain is 94 minutes, and France is 99 minutes. Uh, cast on this is uh, giving most of the names. Once again, leading up, the mighty Howard Vernon plays Baron Max von Klaus, the sadistic man of the title. Uh, Paula Martel plays Karen. Uh, Tura Nelson plays Dorian Vincent. In her debut, Gogo Rojo as Gogo Robbins plays Margaret, a barmaid. Uh, very beautiful woman in this film. A good sense of flesh, nudity in this film. Uh, one of his early ones. Um, let's see here. We have uh, Hugo Blanco plays Ludwig von Klaus. Uh, Fernando Delgado plays Carl Steiner, a journalist. Another famous name used later. Uh, Anna Castor, once again, plays Lita, the bar owner. Anna Castor, she's in other films. Uh, Manuel Alexander plays Theo, the machine. Uh, George Rolin, well, a different, not Jean Rolin, but George Rolin plays Inspector Borowski. Uh, Serafin Garcia Vasquez plays Hansel, the brain. Joaquin Plampona plays Steiner's editor. Uh, let's see. And then we have, uh, skipping through the rest of the names here, Maria Rosa Melin plays Rosa Mayen, and uh, Marius Lesur plays the man blocking traffic on bridge. Credits, director Jess Franco. Writers, Gonzalo Sebastian Dieris, Juan Cobos, Pio Belastros, and Jess Franco. 
based on La Main de Human Mort by David Kuhn, which is Jess Franco. Adaptation and dialogue, René Sibyl. I like this, adapted from his own story. Uh, director of photography, Godo Pacho. Uh, editor, Angel Serrano. Production notes. Uh, we'll skip the synopsis for the review portion. I think I'm going to do a solo review on this because uh, it's hard for me to round up uh, reviewers. I've put in a couple notes out for people to see who wants to guest review. So if you're listening to this and you want to do a episode coming up on uh, this circa of Jess Franco Films, uh, shoot me an email at uh, francoobserver at yahoo or get a hold of us on our Facebook page or our Instagram page, and uh, I can plug you in for being a reviewer on uh, like Dr. Z or uh, Lucky or Succubus or Kiss Me Monster or Castle Fu Manchu or something like that. So anyway, back to the program. Production notes. By now, Franco was building up speed. Straight after La Morette Silva von Blues, Death Whistles the Blues, he had La Mano de la Hombre Muerto, the sadistic bear on Klaus, ready to go. Precise shooting dates are hard to find, but actress Gojo Rojo, who plays a glamorous waitress in the film, told the Madrid newspaper on the 15th of December, 1962, that she had recently finished shooting and expected the film would be released quite soon. In fact, the sadistic bear von Klaus languished for over a year, awaiting its Spanish debut, eventually opening at the end of January 64, six months before the similarly delayed uh, Death Whistles of Blues. Bizarrely, it then spent some time on double bill with the Elizabeth Burton, uh, Taylor, uh, epic Cleopatra. Um, Franco's increasing ties with the French company Euroscene meant the film saw the light of a French projector first. It was released, minus an opening murder scene and the torture of a bound woman, as Le Sadique Baron von Klaus on September 13, 1963. In the meantime, Franco was no doubt gratified to see La Bios Rojos make it to the screen. After a three-year delay playing at Seville's La Remedizo Cinema from March 1st, 1963. All right, the review by Stephen Thrower. Though visually beguiling in gorgeous black and white, La Mano de la Hombre Muerto, a.k.a. the sadistic Baron von Klaus, is too slow for its own good, taking a long time to get to the dramatic meat and padded out with incessant gabble from police a pair of superstitious bumpkins, and an irritating journalist. Replete with stiff-faced men debating crimes we scarcely see, it offers little in the way of sensationalism until two-thirds of the way through when Franco springs upon us a truly startling and memorable sequence, pointing the way to all the sleazy marvels of his later career. This is a tale of a young man's slide into libertinage, being a libertine a slide undertaken with the vertiginous sense of knowing one is falling. Ludwig von Klaus is an unusual monster, fully aware that the further he descends into the abyss, the less chance he will have of living a normal life. Which is a great um, moral and... and uh, uh, what's the right word I'm thinking, right? It's kind of late as I'm recording this. That's uh, basically a good structure that Franco uses quite a bit in his uh, uh, other films. Not all of his films, but certain films later on, which is a Marquis de Sade t- type of setting right there. Okay, um, let's see. Our young anti-hero even ag- agonizes about this after killing his lover, despairing that he will never be able to step back and enjoy the comforts of home and hearth. Instead, he has been seduced by the siren call of a moral freedom, the extreme sensualist's charter of selfish pleasure and hedonistic excesses. Franco sets us up through the classic ghost story notion of an evil ancestor who corrupts the younger man's soul, hence the original Spanish title, which translates as the hand of a dead man. However, the ghostly elements are kept firmly in check, 
with only a brief voiceover to suggest the call of a malign spirit, and even these can be easily explained as Ludwig's insane delusion. Real corruption comes not through spookery, but through exposure to the realm of ideas. On the death of his mother, Ludwig is giving the key to the family cellar and discovers not only tools of torture, but also of a memoir explaining the libertine philosophy of the original Baron von Klaus. Just as the book excites Ludwig's imagination, so too does it pique the interest of the viewer, as it makes the ancestral Baron inescapably reminiscent of Franco's chief literary influence, the Marquis de Sade. The sadistic Baron von Klaus has little by way of story to recommend it. However, as a metaphor for the way the writings of the Marquis de Sade exerted the influence upon the youthful imagination of Jess Franco, the film comes alive. For the malign influence of an older relative, it's easy to substitute de Sade, the ultimate black sheep of European arts and letters. Jess Franco came from an educated family background in which high culture was sacrosanct, so his discovery of Dassad must have felt like an incredibly seductive invitation to leave behind bourgeois norms. Franco's career shows him taking that journey in symbolic form through his cinema. The sadistic Baron von Klaus may only deliver the cruelty and lust of Dassad's work in one key scene, but it also depicts a character from whom, rather like Franco, the door to libertage is creaking temptingly ajar. Six years later, Franco directed Marquis de Sade's Justine, 1968, after which the floodgates opened. He made at least eight more loose adaptations of the Marquis, not to mention many other films of a blatantly sedient bent. Right, like cries of pleasure. Uh, once we arrive at the film's key scene, in which Ludwig takes his secret lover Margaret to the torture chamber for a practical exploration of his ancestors' ideas, the film finds its feet getting down and dirty with some female nudity and intimate fondling. It's all far more daring than one might expect from 1962. Actress Gogo Rojo's exposed, exposed breasts are surprising enough that Hugo Blanco is seen to grope them and lower his mouth onto them is even more startling. The scene is further unsettling because of the supine, partial arousal, aroused demeanor of the victim. Admittedly, she's been drugged and she's embroiled in a passionate love affair with the killer, but the way she responds to his caress suggests that she's masochistically turned on despite her fear. Strong meat in any movie, never mind a Spanish one made under General Franco. As Ludwig belabors the girl with knotted rope, the jiggling of the actress's buttocks leaves us in no doubt that the game is being played quite vigorously by all concerned, even when Franco simply has to obscure what's going on. For instance, when Ludwig suspends Margaret by her wrist and takes a heated sword to her flesh, he captures an unnerving eroticism by showing the victim from the knees down, her bare feet stretching and arching on tiptoe, redolent of a dancer's expressive movements. By conveying agony through the eyes of a callous asceticism, Franco finds a way to symbolize the Sedean mindset without falling foul of the censor. For the rest, the pleasures of this well photographed production are purely decorative. Scenes take place in audible shade with dappled light and strewn leaves, or else they're snowbound and frosty. Uh, through his, throughout his career, Franco made excellent use of architecture. Here he has his victims stalked at night down parades of stone arches, which amply footfall and threaten danger behind each pillar. When the killer attacks Linda in her bedroom, it's a textbook scare that would work just fine in a decent 70s slasher movie like Black Christmas or Communion. Sadly, though, the attack comes to nothing and the scene peters out. Further pictorialism enlivens a chase throughout near-lit streets in a local cemetery, but the story itself never keeps pace with these visually appearing details. Howard Vernon returns to the Franco fold, but he's less well-served this time, as he plays the only red herring, a thoroughly, ordinarily decent man, shielding his married lover with shielding his married lover with nothing in the role to tax his considerable prowess. 
The female lead is unremarkable, not Paula Martell's fault, but Franco's. The character has literally nothing interesting to say or do. And the police chief, Inspector Borowski, is possibly the blandest cop Franco has ever written. As for the dialogue between Borowski and Steiner, the crime journalist, which takes up great swaths of screen time, it's so fundamentally boring one could be forgiving for abandoning the film a third of the way through. But stick with it. If you're willing to overlook some major flaws, enjoy the pretty photography if you want to wait for that six-minute dungeon scene. The sadistic Vera von Klaus is a precursor to some of the darkest currents in Franco's cinema. Yeah, I can see that with uh, the the tone of it and everything. I mean, we had watched it, so I'm looking forward to watching it. Um, okay, he talks about the actress Hugo Blanco, uh, about his career and everything, about how he surprised that he didn't make it bigger. Um, and then uh, same with Gogo Rojo. And um, the writing credits are something of a pile-up with four names... Um, cited for the scripting and a fifth credited with adaptation and dialogue of these Sibyl is the most interesting uh, okay they talk about those uh, music here we go the sadistic Verne von Klaus um, introduces composer Daniel J. White to the Jess Franco universe alright a Yorkshire born Englishman living in Paris White's formidable skills as writer arranger and musician contribute enormously to the Franco over before they had met, he had written songs for Edith Piaf, or Edith Piaf, working with Dizzy Gillespie, and composed scores for 33 films. These small French productions saw little release abroad, but they allowed him to hone his style, a combination of classical and jazz. Franco would go on to use White's music in at least 40 pictures often collaborating by performing the more atonal avant-garde elements himself. White's piano-lit score for the sadistic Baron von Klaus is scored in two clashing stylistic registers, swooning classic-is, classicism and grating avant-gardeism, which mirrors the duality at the heart of the film. The rage of the sadist is powerfully repressed, with the jagged scraping and twanging reminding us that the pianist is creating these harsh atonal sounds by prodding and probing around inside the guts of the instrument, rather as Ludwig intends to do with his victims. In the final scene at the swamp, we hear, for the first time, a Daniel White composition that would turn up many times in the future, a tune-in, five-fourths time, reminiscent of Dave Brubeck's famous Take 5, played here for solo piano. Locations. Shooting took place in two small towns in the Spanish Pyrenees, nestling in the Bastien Valley of Navarre. The first, Elizondo, was used for most of the town sequences, including those on a bridge across from the Bastien River. Other scenes were filmed in nearby Eratizu, which can also be seen in the Franco-pinned uh, Le Gonorys Le François for Leon Komansky, 59. Okay. Uh, studio, is Studio CEA. Connections. I hope these memoirs will be used by my descendants as a guide, writes the deceased Baron von Klaus, an initiation into a passionate world of rare and unknown sensations, a seductive and magic world bred in pain and blood, the tragic eroticism of all the senses, finally ending in death. Such sentiments have the unmistakable ring of the Marquis de Sade, while the phrase tragic eroticism is drawn from a chapter heading in Jorg's Batale's The Tears of Eros, first published in France in 1961. Franco has Ludwig wear, of all things, a duffel coat as he stands over the unconscious Margaret, a mundane detail that directly echoes another chilling ordinary killer, Mary Lewis, Mark Lewis and Michael Powell's Peeping Tom. Interestingly, both killers have been corrupted by exposure to the ideas of dominant male relative. Apropos of nothing, we hear Baron Max von Klaus, Howard Vernon, ask his manservant, Where is the book about Meribod? All right, uh... I'm going to go over it quite a bit here. I'm just going to kind of cut through a little shorter. Other versions. Uh, the original Spanish cut uh, begins with a unsettling pre-credit sequence 
montage excised from Baron von Klaus. Totally 90, sec- 90 seconds. The missing material begins with a crane shot advancing on a cottage window at night uh, with the camera passing through a closed line of ladies' apparel. Cutting to within the cottage, we see a hatted figure silhouetted at the window. A trio of shots depict Dina Loy uh, in her first of several roles for Jess gazing at the camera, clasping a torn curtain and lying on a bed in what appears to be a torture chamber. The woman is then garroted in deliberately stylistic or stylized imitation of slow motion by someone wearing a white stocking mask. A cut back to the silhouetted figure seems to imply that the figure is observing the murder, not participating. The stocking masked figure then stabs the woman who is lying passively on a bedspread, a shot filmed in a mirror positioned on the ceiling. Mirror shot. Uh, all of which is very strange, unsettling, and intriguing. Who is the watcher? Who is the masked assailant? Perhaps the reason the sequence was removed is these questions are never answered in the film. <laughs> and yet, opaque through this montage may seem from a strictly rational point of view, it does serve an useful function to create heightened expectation and lend the film a creeping undertow of menace and eroticism. Menace is amplified, too, during the Canberra Hotel Room murder of nightclub singer Dorian Vincent, which in the Spanish version involves three stabs to the gut with a long blade. The French cut eliminates all but one plunge of the knife. Uh, Also missing from the French version is a scene in which the Klaus family servant discovers Steiner, the journalist, exploring the torture chamber in which the dead body of Margaret hangs by the wrists. Displaying a previously unsuspected commitment to Ludwig's privacy, the servant leaps on Steiner and attacks him. The struggle ends with Steiner throttling the man with his bare hands. This was perhaps cut because it made no sense. The man servant ignores Margaret's corpse, which suggests that he's in cahoots with Ludwig, though we never see or hear anything between to support the idea. Um... The sequence in Ludwig's torture chamber is the first example of Franco shooting two different versions simultaneously, one clothed and one nude and explicit, uh, with the intention of using the former in the home market and the latter in the export. Uh, The explicit material was clearly shot at the same time as the rest. The set dressing, the actors all match up. However, in the Spanish cut, Gogo Rojo remains swathed in an evening dress and we never see her harmed. Even the shots of Ludwig placing irons in a the a bizarre are removed. He instead he simply clasps Margaret in a rough embrace. At which point the film cuts to him leaving the house. Wow. Uh, okay. All right. Problematica. Some sources credit assistant director Enrique Berenger as playing the doctor. Simultaneously, some credit actor Jose Basida, although the film he's in viable in the current prints. Um, and it said basically the film attracted modest plaudits from the ABC critics paper. So, all right. So that is, uh, the sadistic Baron von Klaus. Uh, but yeah, it's funny reading about it. Uh, it sounds like he reused this storyline for, uh, was it Dracula's daughter with, um, uh, Brent Nichols. So it sounds a lot like that with the chamber and the key and don't go in there and, and the family secret. And, and yeah, and the, the, Telling of the um, the affair and yeah, there's quite a bit. This is basically uh, Dracula's daughter's a retelling or a uh, remake of the sadistic Baron von Klaus. So yeah, it's interesting to see these original ideas. He uses them for the first time before he reshapes them and changes them to something else later on. So all right, so uh, hang out and uh, listen through the bumper music and you'll hear my review and uh, what I thought of the sadistic Baron Von Klaus Uh, and I'll go over the Franco list and see what I spot and uh, what he uses and what is not used so all right hang out and uh, I'll see you on the other side bye Hey buddies, this is Jason once again, and I just viewed the sadistic Baron Von Klaus, which is uh, film seven from Jess Franco. Um, In the uh, book Murderous Passions, um, it doesn't really give it a high regard as much, and he kind of downplays a few things, the weak parts that I can see uh, Stephen Thrower having a problem with, and really just goes on about the 
torture chamber at the end, which is cool and stuff. But, uh, you know, on my end, uh, I really liked this film much more than I thought after reading his thoughts on it first before I watched it. And uh, I seem to find that when I come into it with a little lowered expectations, it turns around to be quite better than I find or than I thought. And I end up finding other things in it that uh, maybe aren't remarked about or but are very important that uh, I don't know, maybe I look in too far, but I seem to have found a few things in here that I really dig. And uh, yeah, this film, uh, I don't know if I like it more than Dr. Orloff, but uh I don't know. In my opinion, there's some things I like about it more. So anyway, let me give you um, the synopsis from the book, and then I'll give you my uh, review of the film, and we'll go over the uh, Franco list and all that stuff. All right, synopsis. In the Austrian Alpine town of Holfen, a young woman is found murdered. Theo and Hansel, two woodcutters, stop off at a bar where they tell Dr. Kalman an academic studying local folk tales about the history of the von Klaus family, in particular the murderous cruelty of the first Baron von Klaus, whose seventeenth century ghost is said to haunt the mists and quagmires of the surrounding countryside. Soon after, the woodcutters discover the dead body of another young woman, the current patriarch of the von Klaus family and chief suspect for the murders is Max, who lives with his elderly sister, Elisa. Elisa is dying, which prompt a visit from her son, Ludwig, accompanied by his fiancée, Karen. Elisa reveals to Ludwig the whereabouts of a key to the von Klaus dungeon, which has been locked for many years. She begs him to end the family curse for all time and take his fiancée far away. Ludwig enters the dungeon and finds a memoir written by the original Baron von Klaus, expounding his immoral philosophy. Later that night, Dorian Vincent, a chateuse at the bar, leaves after her show to meet a man at a local hotel. The man, his face concealed, stabs her to death with an antique dagger. Max, under the assumed name of Rudolf Bender, spends a night at a local hotel. He is in a secret relationship with a married woman, Lida, L-I-D-A, at the local, the local bar owner. When Max is arrested under suspicion of murder, Lida is forced to come forward and reveal their relationship in order to save him. That night, a masked intruder enters Lida's bedroom and tries to kill her, but is frightened away when someone raises the alarm. A posse of townspeople give chase, but the trail ends in the graveyard. The attacker has vanished. Meanwhile, Margaret, a beautiful barmaid in the, in the town, is seduced by Ludwig. But has he been spending too much time in the family cellar, reading Baron von Klaus's memoirs? Uh, the answer to that is yes. So, um, that's the basic synopsis of this film, which leads up to the end, but not the conclusion. So, yeah, um, I will give spoilers, but, you know, the film was, what, made in uh, 1962. So, you know, I mean, it's not like it's a new release, like Spider-Man or something, uh, which I see spoilers on. Anyway, so, uh, okay, so give you some my notes on this, what I thought, some little uh, high spots that I dug a lot and stuff. Um, this film opens with a piano playing, uh, you, you see hands playing a piano and uh, a Steinway and Sons piano, which is a high class piano. And uh, it sets a classy tone for the film. I found a very elegant, like uh, very, um, um, like you're seeing it, a piece play, you're seeing all the credits roll. Uh, it, set, it sets a really nice classy tone of elegance for the film, which is nice. Um, there's an early bar scene, like to talk about Lida, L-I-D-A, which is funny that Franco ends up being with Lena Romay, but uh, a lot of these films, he always has a character, Lita or Lida, which uh, seems to be a constant female um, antagonist, usually, or, or a, a side character, even, more or less, on in these early films. So it's like... He always has this Soldat Miranda type somewhat. Not in this film as much, but you see that early on in a few of the early films. These first, you know, six, seven films. And then uh, 
you see uh, the name of Lita or Lena or something like that always coming up. So interesting uh, as you see what transpires later. All right. So, yeah, like I say in this, you see an early bar scene with a female bartender. Um, that's one of those things you see a lot in these films. There's usually a scene where people go into a bar and uh, everybody's having a good time, especially in the 70s ones. And there's always a female bartender at the bar and she's usually uh, in charge of the place and it's her place. So, yeah, it's pretty cool to see that in this. So that's an early uh, prototype for his films later on. So, yeah, another thing I was saying with this film, it's um, he has crane shots and he has some really nice stuff that he doesn't have later on. But this is one of the films I would say maybe his first where I start seeing the leaner Jess Franco, where it's uh, not too... I mean, the chamber is really a pretty good set and everything, if it's a real place or what, but that's... I mean, there's some uh, money in it, but you could tell that this production didn't was a lot cheaper than his earlier six films, so definitely you see uh, a leaner kind of uh well i mean not besides we are 18 but with the subject matter i could say it's basically a, a leaner version of uh dr orloff so that's cool you could start seeing what he can do with less money that's what i meant to say so yeah this is cool that's one thing with this film that i start seeing um a lot of film is snowbound uh, i like a lot of the transition between the old gothic countryside and then the modern of the younger Ludwig with his convertible car and jazz music played with, or con- contrasted with the classical music and the Gothic countryside, the clashing of styles I thought was really cool. Um, and then, of course, the jazz music played with any sinister killing or death or, or looking at weapons or anything. They have that jazz over it. It's a really nice juxtaposition that uh, worked really nice. Um, there's a uh, yeah, cut from the dead woman found to the modern city where uh, the writer is sent overseas to investigate. That's a nice transition where they find her dead body that it cuts to like modern day with like Paris or something or somewhere like that. And you see cars and it's a busy, um, busy town, like a busy downtown metropolitan area. Um, Holfen was the mentioned earlier, the name of the town. It's kind of cool. It's like a Wolfen. Um, you see a ship model in Baron uh, von Klaus's house. Max's place there. Uh, like I said, yeah, jazz music and that. Um, there's a symbol that I like when uh, they talk about that, where the elder sister tells the youngest or Ludwig, you know, um, that uh, you know, here's the key to this place, and here's the deal and stuff, and you need to get away from here. If she would have just kept it to herself and died, none of that evil would have happened. So it's like she almost wanted to burden the kid with the family curse. And that's another thing I was going to bring up later, that this is a good film where it comes to passing on a family guilt or a curse or something that you have to give to the next person for them to suffer through. And she discovered that chamber and tried to lock it away, but she had to always carry that burden. Now she's giving the burden to somebody else. And you see that later on with Dracula's Daughter, which is pretty much a remake of this film. And then... Um, you see some of it in Virgin the Modern, The Living Dead, and um, the other side of the mirror, too, where the curse of the father, um, and in the swamp scenes, too, of the, some of the pooling of going through. I'm sorry, that was in Virgin the Living Dead. But, yeah, some of the um, uh, other side of the mirror with, like, the father and the dead father and seeing him and stuff, so or hearing him and feeling his presence pulling you to somewhere. Um, but, yeah, visually it was cool, like the key inside the Bible, inside the false bottom of the cabinet so it was like you know uh, a drawer within a drawer within a drawer it's always the hidden space which is almost like the chamber itself is hidden and you need that's inside of another thing that is inescapable um let's see uh yeah like i said you see the, the arriving to see the dying relative and the warning to uh the last surviving outside outsider family member that's not part of the patriarch uh like a virgin among living dead the same way it's the family's there, which, of course, has um, uh, Howard Vernon, too, which is cool to carry that through. I didn't catch that. So it's funny watching these out of order because I watched Virgin Among the Living Dead before this, and you watch this later, and you see, oh, they pulled this and this and this from that. So it's interesting. But, uh, yeah, there's a few pieces from this that definitely fit into that film. Um, there's really soft classical music at the crypt door when uh, Ludwig discovers it. And it's inviting, and as soon as he goes through the door, it changes as he enters and descends, which is a key word, down the stairs. 
so he's descending into the evil. He's like sinking into the evil. And at the end of the film, he's sinking into the swamp. So he's sinking into the evil of his grandfather, which is really cool because in the film, he's walking down the stairs. Here's his grandfather's voice. And when he's dying, he sinks into the swamp. And here's his grandfather's voice. Um, so that's the looping of that there. Uh, and he reads the book. And that scene's really good where he reads the father's work about all your senses and the last is sense that you will discover is pain and death and that's the last like sensation but that that sequence is really really good where he discovers all about uh, almost a, a, a um, Marquis de Sade philosophy and discovers the essence and the lurity and the uh, inviting ness of evil um, so uh, and then you see the black gloved hand when he's he his first victim he squeezes her hand hard and he calls her my love so it's almost like an S&M thing where he's got the gloved hand and he's saying oh I love you and he's, he's like grabbing her hand and twisting it really hard and kissing her at the same time with that every scene of him you see that where he's kissing later on he's kissing one of the girls really hard um, before he knocks her unconscious and that and the other girl he's squeezing her hand really hard as he's kissing her and that so you see the the softness with the pain the S&M type of flip side of the coin um, you see oh, it's cool a lot of this film you see a lot of uh, cold breath shots you can tell it's really cold where they're at morning time when they're outside doing the exteriors around the castles and that um, um, yeah Max and Lita have, have an affair which uh, it was almost like I had a daughter of Dracula the same, same story twist of that um, and her death scene uh with jazz is uh, the same as the junior car drive. Oh yeah, yeah. The same. So you see, uh, when she gets killed, they have the same jazz as when he has the car. So it automatically links him with the murder. Uh, there's a good chase scene where they try to go after him, and uh, they give chase to him on foot, and he kind of disappears into the graveyard. And they have to, villagers have torches, kind of like Frankenstein, and they believe that it's the ghost, and that when the ghost goes into the graveyard, because they chase him to the graveyard, and they say, "Oh well, he's a ghost now. He'll he'll kill us all if we go in there." So they automatically are ruled by the superstition, and they're controlled by the superstition that a ghost is doing the killing and not a regular person. So therefore, if they go and fight this ghost in a graveyard, he'll kill them all. But the journalist is smarter; he knows. Uh, reality and compared to superstition so he goes in and the guy can't find the guy but it's a really great scene cemetery scene is really well shot really well lit at night black and white uh, oh yeah so I forgot to say too this whole film's in black and white really great black and white lighting a lot of cool stark stuff really great crossings of gothic style with modern things um, which he does later in the Dracula Prisoner Frankenstein and uh, the erotic rites of Frankenstein or yeah yeah, Frankenstein. Those two Frankenstein films, kind of the same deal with the gothic versus uh, modern times clashing as the monsters clash. Uh, let's see. Um, Vernon, or yeah, Howard Vernon's affair with Mary Lita, I thought was really beautiful. Like that, basically, he has this thing that he doesn't want people spying on him because he has an affair with a married woman, and he has this love that's really hidden. So everybody has something that's hidden in this film. You have the crypt of the grandfather, which is hidden, the family secrets. And his secret is he... It is an evil secret as well. He's, he's committing adultery, and if they're Catholic, then that's that's a, that's an, a sin as well, and one of the heavier sins. And uh, so he has to keep this hidden, and he'll stay in jail, which is his punishment, his purgatory, and keeps his mouth shut because he loves her so much. And... Uh, I thought of all this, it was really beautiful, that sequence with Howard Vernon, because if you just go into it not knowing the film, look at the cover, and it says the sadistic Baron von Klaus, and it's got Howard Vernon on here praying. And, um, yeah, earlier, too, I was not to jump around, but that shot on the DV or cover is him praying, and there's a good scene where his sister dies, and he has this little pillow with a uh, altar praying they have around for when people die. And you see he believes it more than Ludwig, so he's a good man at heart, and he believes in certain things, and, and he has that feeling. He's a painter, and, and he likes to look around and study. He stays in the library. He's an academic-type man. So he loves Lita and uh, has this hidden thing that keeps him where he is. So, yeah, I thought it was really cool, that, that aspect of the film of this couple that have this love that they have to hide from the world because it's not right because of her situation. That was really really nice touch. 
Uh, and that was a nice thing about this film that doesn't really get spoken about, but that's a really nice subplot. Um, compared to Ludwig, so you see two different kinds of relationship where he says, I love you to death and kisses her hand uh, when he uh, carries the uh, von Klaus tradition and he says he has to carry it on. Uh, you have a lot of jazz with the evil shots. Um, Ludwig wears a suit like Morpho and like uh, you see a lot of the well-dressed evil, the black suit, black tie, that seems to be a thing. Um, also, too, the guy that plays uh, Ludwig kind of reminded me of like him playing it like like a young Martin Brando, and he's kind of squinty-eyed a little bit and really uh, um, uh, studious and very you know solemn and, and very um, in thought and uh, stoic, I should say. He plays it very stoic and kind of like a young Martin Brando. I was thinking when I was watching this, so I'm curious if he was trying to do that acting style. Um, but yeah, so, and, and he's, he's a good character. Um, but so, uh, the first nudity in this film is actually, uh, in at 78 minutes. And, uh, it's cool because when you see Goho Go Rojo get killed, she's very seducted, very seduced by the evil. She knows she's going to be killed. She goes, I know you're the killer. So early. Okay. So he has an, he, so she knows that he has a fiance and they meet in a, his convertible and clandestine uh, by themselves. And she says, well, you know, you're going to marry her. And he says, you make a good wife. And she says, well, d- would I make a good wife? And he says, no. And she says, well, yeah, well, but, but you love me more than her, right? And he says, well, I don't know. And then later on, he puts the chloroform on her, knocks her out, takes her back to his the, the cellar. She wakes up and she thinks he's the, she goes, you're the killer, right? And he goes, I don't know. The same kind of response he gave to, well, you love me more than her. And then, uh, even though she knows he's the killer, she still kisses him and she's seduced by the evil. So the seduction of evil is very, um, uh, seductive evil and, and she is seduced by it. So she, uh, succumbs to that and she just knows that that's how it is. So it, that's one thing too, it shows is how seductive and powerful that this evil is that drew him into this abyss and is drawing her into it. And, and she's taken by the seduction and the elegance and the allure of it as well. And she dies for that. Uh, he whips her and, and all these things and has shackles and, and all that stuff. It's interesting too the sequence where he takes her and kills her, all this stuff, whip, chains her up and whips her and stick kills her. Um, you don't have any sound of like the struggle or anything happening in the place. It's just music over the sequence, which was interesting to me because I thought you'd have the sound of at least the environment and then the music laid over it, but they took out all the natural sound of the room and everything and just had the music track over it, which is interesting, but I don't know. I think I would have preferred it the other way with both. Um, and like thrower and remarked, uh, in the part of his review, her dangling feet as she is killed is really cool. So it's almost like she's dancing. Like he said, the ballerina before she dances off to her death. Um, there's a beautiful forest shot later in the swamp, um, which is reminding me of Virgin Mon living dead. Uh, the grandfather has died in the swamp. He's the swamp man. And, uh, the Ludwig walks to his death in the swamp. And that's his full circle again, like Virgin Mon living dead. Um, and also too, they talk about, he tells Kareen about the cellar and that, and all, I thought the cellar is almost symbolizes the walls that you build around yourself and your special place that you hide, that you keep things away from other people, and that was a secret of the family and that he, Ludwig, was into, and uh, each person had their secret, like I said before. Um, but yeah, it was cool that I liked how, uh, before this, Death Whistles the Blues, he remade his Kiss Me Killer, and of course, the film before this, uh, Awful Dr. Orloff, was remade later as the Jack the Ripper. And uh, this one, um, uh, Sadistic Baron von Klaus, was later remade as Daughter of Dracula. And there's pieces of this also in Virgin and Mon Living Dead, with a lot of the, th- the storyline through. And, of course, the ending's the same. And uh, also, like I said, Other Side of the Mirror with the family curse of the father. But, yeah, Virgin and Mon Living Dead, definitely. Even the walking into the swamp, the, the kind of the pooling shot of that... Um, and uh, yeah, some really interesting stuff. But yeah, and of course, uh, I thought it was a good film, much much better than I thought. So um, I definitely dig it a lot, and uh, I'll definitely watch it again uh, later on at some time. All right, I'm gonna go hit the Franco list and tell you what I found that's in the other films and what is not in this film. So 
time for the list, the Franco list. All right, Franco list. All right, number one, body of water. There's no body of waters in this because it's all like frozen and uh, it's all snow in that. So I guess there's water all around, but yeah, no body of waters. Um, there is a or no sail boat, but there's a boat. The only boat in this is in the office, uh, Max's library or area of the house. There's a big big boat model that you see and it's prominently featured. Uh, for palm trees, no palm trees in this, but there is trees like in the forest, in the swamp area, well, not swamp area, but the forest, uh, leading to the swamp, really beautiful tree shots, just bare trees, almost like a Miller's Crossing type of shots, uh, really, really beautiful stuff. Number five, jungle sound effects. Well, there's no jungles in this, but there is a few bird sounds, uh, for the forest and that, but very minimal. Number six, chained up person. Oh yeah. Uh, Gogo is chained up, uh, with the shackles in the bed. And the famous scene, which this film is known for, she's hanging up uh, naked. So, yeah, you definitely chained up person. This is one of the first big ones besides Orloff. Orloff in this. Uh, seven, dance scenes on stage stripping. No uh, dance scenes on stage stripping. There's like a, a female performer, a nightclub performer, and a band, and you see an audience watching her. So that's a thing he used later on as a stripper motif. But in this, he's using it as just a female entertainer because he's not allowed to really use a lot of nudity especially in public so so yeah that's a uh, half point on that eight club scenes dancing yeah that kind of goes with seven a little bit people are kind of milling about not really dancing so but there's like club scene of that and those two kind of go together uh nine jazz music most definitely yes cool jazz music in this mixed with uh, some avant-garde stuff and classical music very cool Number 10, excessive zooms. Number 11, out-of-focus shots. Negative on both. Uh, very uh, trained film. A lot of cool crane shots. Very elegant. Uh, very on guard with this stuff here. He's still kind of working tight and uh, with a crew and, and kind of not being sloppy. So he's he's got his, got his shit together, so to speak, on this. Definitely. Uh, let's see. Number 10. 12 mirror shots yes um not a lot but there's a cool one um in uh the baron's house there i had written down mirror shots on something let's see where was it at here where's my notes number 12 mirror shots yeah mirror in the um in the office of the library th that area there's a cool mirror shot in that uh but not very many just just one um 13 mind control theme most definitely uh, Ludwig is controlled by the grandfather. Oh, yeah, so also that always triggers in my head. Um, what was it? Fear. Uh, what was darn it was again? <laughs> fear or uh, desire. Let's see. Fear or desire. No, oh, well, I say maybe desire of fear because he desires. Yeah, I'd say maybe desire. Well, he desires the fear that brings to others and, he, and it's that desire of evil so yeah it's the seductive evil so this film is all about desire which results in fear so uh that's another one i should write on my list is fear desire um because steven thrower brought that up now that always sticks in my head um so all right uh, my control theme back to that yeah definitely he's controlled by the spirit of his grandfather either uh physically or um uh, lyrically or you know symbolically whether you believe he's possessed by a ghost or it's just the thought and just he's he's seduced by that thought and that lifestyle so yeah definitely mind controlled uh 14 magic tongue scenes that's a negative no lena no magic tongue no lena no tongue uh let's see number 15 red light that would be a negative black and white film so i couldn't tell um number 16 sheepskin rug or masturbation with a c item uh, none of the, none no sheepskin, no masturbate. This is 1962, so you don't see that yet. Well, sheepskin could be whatever, but you know what I mean. All right, 17, mad scientist. Um, not really. Um, I mean, the crypt could be like a laboratory, I guess, kind of. Uh, it's a like torture dungeon, but yeah, no, not really. 18, fish tank shots, that's negative. 19, talking parrot or talking animals, none of that. That's later on. Uh, 20 in credits, yes or no? Yes, it says Finn at the end. Handwritten notes or signs or any shoddiness like that. No, it's actually pretty pretty good. Um, he's got his stuff together here. Um, he's got a little not doing that here. So, 
22 spiral staircase. Yes, there's one spiral staircase shot. Yeah, there's one going down to the uh, crypt. You see when he carries the woman, um, the last go-go, he's carrying her down to the crypt. You see it kind of in that deal there. And then it cuts to the normal staircase after the spiral staircase that you see by himself, which I'm sure is two different locations because you don't see them locked together. It's one sitting up to the other. It actually has to be. Uh, number 23, inept cops, most definitely. Uh, everything is done by the journalist and everybody else, and uh, they think they have the killer, and it's not, and everybody lies to him, and so, yeah. But he's inept, too, because of the townspeople around him are all crooked and have something to do or keep, secrets to keep or whatever, so he, that corrupts his investigation as well. Uh, 24, Billy Chains, negative. Number 25, Kinks. I would say uh, Whipping, s and um a few other um, blade things and certain things. But yeah, so it's starting to get a little bit kinky here, but not, not, not as much. But uh, you see a few little kink, lights of kink pop through, which is a beautiful uh, light to be bathed in. So if I do say so myself. All right. So uh, yeah, that's kind of that on the Franco list. Anything else I want to bring up on that list? No, I, I definitely liked it. Uh, it was better than I thought it was going to be. Because uh, kind of read something and you kind of already have your mindset, kind of, what you're going to go into it. And then it's always nice to be like, wow, this is pretty fucking cool. Um, yeah, I like the film. I like the style of it. I like the wardrobe. Um, Howard Vernon was interesting. He's one of the ones where he's kind of wasted because he's a red herring. But he's not wasted because his character is really cool. And I like the arc, like I said, with him and that. And it's sad that he gets stabbed by his brother. And But it's the family curse, so it's it's what they have to be. And that's just kind of how it is so all right so um i think i'm gonna wrap up this part of it here um giving you a, the review on uh the sadistic baron von klaus um if you like this film and uh you like the podcast uh consider donating to the podcast if you so desire um let's see you can find us on facebook you can find us on instagram we have pages there if you want to get a hold of us, you can get a hold of us at uh, FrancoObserver at Yahoo.com. Uh, let's see. Please download and subscribe all the episodes. Or, or download and subscribe. Uh, tell your friends about the episode. Tell your friends about the show uh, if you like and all that stuff. And uh, please help us because doing these every week. And it's good to see if people dig it and want to keep it going. So if you keep listening, I'll keep putting them out. Uh, I'm kind of doing a lot of these singletarily because it's kind of hard to get people to join in and to get on people's schedules to do Zooms or get people together to do them in person. So I'm kind of just soldiering on, knocking these out. And uh, I don't know, I might have some more guests again one day. But uh, in the meantime, instead of beating myself up and going through hard things to get things going, I'm just knocking them out. So uh, if you like this, uh, me doing it this way still, keep listening and let me know. I would appreciate it. Uh, yeah, so download, subscribe, favorite platform, donate, tell a friend, share, uh, Facebook, Instagram, you know the drill. All right, well, this is Jason Rudy, and I'm signing off for this episode. This is, once again, episode 72, The Sadistic Baron Von Klaus, film number seven from Uncle Jess. So coming up next is f uh, film number eight, and which will be episode 73, and that is Rififi in the city. So, all right. Adios. Buenas noches. Mm -hmm.